was his original design? We, we, we've become so distorted in our, in our perception. I was reading an article this morning that just so-and-so's son is now a girl. Really? How does that happen? Can I share it with you? God has never woke up one morning and looked at a boy and went, oops, gosh, I meant to make a girl. <laughs> he's, never, he's never done that, or vice versa. Junk science. I, I want to tell you, much of science today even as near as 30 years ago, certainly 50 years ago, the junk science of today would never have gotten off the laboratory floor, let alone be published in scientific journals and make it in to university classrooms. But today... There is such a spirit of delusion that we are beginning to propagate junk science that has no true scientific basis behind it whatsoever. And we're believing it is true because it's being portrayed as true. But that's exactly what Scripture told us. There would come a time when men would actually love lies and hate truth. And that's what we got going on right now. They hate it when you say stuff like what I just said. When you are born with a male biological body, you are man. When you are born with female biological body, you are woman. It's just, that's just how it is. God designed it that way. Let me show you. Go with me to Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. Look at what he said. Would you read it out loud with me, please, everyone together? Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Oh, stop. Did you see that? Right there. Right there. And by the way, can I tell you something? In that biological creation, when, when God created them male and female, it's not just the plumbing that's different. I mean, it is different. But the very being, the way they are created inside, you see, the way God designed it, plumbing, emotions, their thought life, their brain, it all fits perfect because that female is supposed to be your other self. And so you just fit perfectly like that. In the womb. When that boy is developing in the womb, there comes a point where there's a hormonal bath that goes over the boy's brain, and it separates the membrane between the right and left brain so that the boy is left more connected to the left brain, and so he's more logic-centered. He's a warrior. He's a conqueror. He's out to conquer. He wants to protect he wants to get it done, and his sense of worth and value comes from his ability to conquer and do. That's why when a guy loses his job and can't find another one, it just devastates him. He feels like he's, he's a worthless hole in the ground. Now, that doesn't happen when a, when a girl is in the womb. When the girl is in the womb, she doesn't get that hormonal bath. That's why women are the only ones in their right mind. That's true. But they're, but they're feelers. They feel through life and their emotions. 
Hallmark Channel wouldn't exist if it wasn't for women in the world. And because they don't get that hormonal bath, in any given conversation, they can speak out of their intellect, they can speak out of their will, they can speak out of their emotions, they can speak out of their spirit. And they can do that all in one paragraph. <laughs> and the guy's sitting there going, women are crazy, you know? Because they can do that. Because women speak pink, guys speak blue. Because God designed us. Isn't, isn't it marvelous what God designed? Yes. Don't fight it. Live with it. Embrace it. Find joy in it. Find fulfillment in it. She's my other half. I can tell you right now, I would never have the 49 years of success I've had if it wasn't for this woman in my life. I can just tell you. And she doesn't dominate me. She doesn't control me. She doesn't manipulate me. She learned really early in our marriage she starts a crying jags, I'm lost. I have no idea what to do when a woman does that. What do you do with it? I don't know. That's why gals kind of laugh at me when they come in and they want counseling. And they sit down and I start off this way. I go, okay, I want you to think real hard now. In three sentences, you only get three sentences. That right there drives them crazy. You get three sentences, tell me what's wrong. And I've had him look at me and go, only three sentences? Only three sentences. I don't think I can do that. Yeah, you can't try it. Why? I'm blue. You start spider webbing, you will lose me the second spider web you start. <laughs> Amen. Amen. On the other hand, guys, you know we're logic, and we and, and we're logic, and we can. We're not real good at multitasking. We're trying to talk to somebody. And that phone's ringing in the background. It's driving us crazy. <laughs> okay. Listen, oh, I'm I'm wanting you to see. This is a God design. This is a God design. But there's another part to this that is critical in your life. Grab hold of this. This is important. Look right here. Start with me right here, would you? So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then, say it with me, then God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over everything that moves on the earth. Yes. Wow. Wow. Look at what's going on. God said, I want to make man, and I'm going to give him dominion. Now, what's with that? See, that word for dominion is a military term. Now, what's up with that? Because, see, when God was creating mankind, he was making a whole new species of being. Sometime in eternity past, and we're not told when or how, how long before he made the earth, but sometime in eternity past, God created a whole species of being called angels. And he made archangels, Gabriel, Michael, and one called Lucifer. Lucifer was the covering cherub. He was the head archangel. He was over all the other angels. He was the worship leader in heaven. He was the head of commerce. We discover all of this in Ezekiel 28. He was a very powerful being. And the scripture says he was the most beautiful of beings. But in his pride, he became lifted up. And he said, you know what? I can be God. I can do this God thing. 
And in his pride, he made a plan to overthrow God and to throw God off the throne and to sit on the throne himself. And he got a third of the angels to follow him. So obviously, angels had free wills. And they rebelled against God. Michael led the armies of the good angels. They defeated Lucifer through him and the third of the angels following him. They threw them out of heaven. And where did they go? Interesting. Interesting. They went to the atmosphere surrounding this planet in this small solar system. And that became their dwelling place. That became the kingdom of Lucifer. He became the ruler of the darkness. He became the prince of the power of the air. The spiritual wickedness in the atmosphere around that planet. And then again, we're not told when, but sometime before creation in eternity past, the Trinity had a meeting. And in that meeting, the Trinity said, let's make a new species of being. Let's make a species of being in our own image. Angels are not made in the image of God. Let's make a species in our own image. And so God did. He created mankind, human beings, made in his image. God is a trinity. We're a trinity. Body, soul, and a spirit. God has a creative mind. We have a creative mind. God has the capacity to love. We have the capacity to love. We're made in the image of Almighty God. And God then did something amazing. He took that new species of being and he placed them on the very planet where Lucifer's kingdom surrounded. And when he placed them there, he said to them, I want you to be fruitful and to multiply. Look what he gave to them. Look at this. This is amazing. God said, be fruitful. Now, I didn't put the Hebrew words up here for each of these because you would forget them 10 seconds after I said them. That's okay. But I want to I show you the definition that they bring. When he talked about being fruitful, talked about in its, in its original sense, it was to procreate. Have kids. And God didn't say to Adam and Eve, each of you have a child and a half. Actually, in the term there, it is be very fruitful, be very bountiful. How come? Because in Psalms, it says, happy is the man whose quiver is full of them. And there's no man that's going to go to battle with an arrow and a half in his quiver, or three in his quiver, or six in his quiver. Come on. He's going to have a full quiver when he goes to battle. And Almighty God says to us, I want you to bountifully be fruitful. Not just in your family life, but in your career, in every area of your life. I want you to be bountiful and fruitful. And Peter talked about this in his second epistle when he said, Giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, to patience godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness God kind of love. For if these things be in you and abound, listen, they will make you that you will neither be barren nor unfruitful. So if you feel like your life is a dead, dry stick, you can be certain that's not God. That's Satan at work. And it's time to turn it around. Because God means for you to be fruitful, very fruitful. Amen. Amen. Pastor, I'm so glad you told me that. I don't want to live this barren life not one more day. Multiply. This word literally means to greatly increase, to become numerous, to just overflow. Multiply. Multiply. He wants your business to multiply. He wants every area of your life to multiply. He wants you to be very, very blessed in your life. 
then he said, replenish the earth. This is an interesting word because it, it, has, it has a dual meaning to it. It means to sufficiently supply, to provide adequately. But it also carries with it the meaning it's used to talk about the consecration of a priest. So it very much carries the concept that you are a priest of God on the earth. And because you are, you are going to be able to sufficiently supply what is needed. Wow. Wow. Look at that. Look at that. How many like the life so far God meant for you to have? Huh? Amen. Well, someone says, well, no, no, he's talking to Adam and Eve. We'll get there. Hold on. But then he comes to these two military terms. And when I first discovered these were military terms, I went, now this is really odd. Because you're talking about a really bountiful life, a, a very good life, a very blessed life. And now you start talking about military stuff. Go and conquer. Go and be victorious. Go and attack the enemy and defeat the enemy and take over his territory and subjugate that territory under your authority. Yes. Have dominion. Rule there. Exercise authority there. Really? Really? And when you look at it, it is everything in life Go back to that scripture. Every living thing that moves on the earth, we're supposed to have dominion. That flies in the face of the Green Party today. That human beings are evil, we're wicked. No, 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 we're supposed to be, we're supposed to be ruling the earth and subduing it and having dominion. That's what God meant for human beings to do. Now, that doesn't matter whether you're, whether you're red or whether you're African-American or whether you're Hispanic or whether you're Native American or whether you've come from India or whether you've come from China. It doesn't matter. Human beings. Go with me to, to, to Psalm 8. Go ahead and go over to Psalm 8. Look at this. This is not just talking about, okay, just, just Adam and Eve. Just Adam and Eve. Psalm 8 says it this way. Would you read it with me? What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visited him? For you have made him a lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Look at that. What is man? Mankind. Human being, you visit him. You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Yes. Yes. That's you. This is written to mankind. That is you. That is you. This is to you. I'm wanting you to understand, when God originally designed human beings, he had you in mind, and this is what he had in mind for you. Amen. That you would be fruitful. That you would multiply. That you would, you would give increase. That as a, as a priest of Almighty God, you would sufficiently supply. And that you would subdue and you would take dominion. Not be dominated, you would take dominion. That's God's original design. Now the writer of Hebrews talked about this in Hebrews chapter 2. In fact, he quoted this Psalm 8 scripture. And he said this, he said, He left nothing that is not put under him. Look at that, look at the power of that. But he didn't stop there. He went on to say, but we do not yet see 
all things put under him. Well, why? His paradise was lost. God originally designed man with this amazing glory. This amazing glory. His whole being was filled with God's glory. Wanda recently helped me see something I had not seen before, but as I looked it up, I realized it was scriptural. When God originally created Adam and Eve in the original creation, they didn't have a human body like we have now, subject to sickness, subject to some of the frailties. They had a glorified body that was filled and totally radiant with the glory of God itself. So they didn't have to wear clothing like we do because their nakedness was not revealed because they were so filled with God's glory. God's glory clothed them, and that was all you could see when you looked at them. You looked at Adam, you looked at Eve, you just saw them radiating the glory of Almighty God because they were in their glorified body. It didn't get sick, it didn't get old, it didn't wear out. It didn't get diseased. It was the glorified body. But when God said to them, the day you disobey, you will surely die, they did. The day they disobeyed Almighty God, they died. They lost that glorified body, and now they were in a body like what you and I have, and it was subject to disease, it was subject to growing old, and it was under the curse of death. Paradise was lost. And not only that, the subjugator now became the subjected. Dominated by the principalities and powers of the air. Living in the fear of death all their life. Because Lucifer at that time had the power of death. They were now living life that we are living in sin. But didn't catch God by surprise. See, in somewhere in eternity past, when he designed this whole thing and said, we're going to make a new species of being, we're going to give them this, we're going to bless them with this, God said, now we, we know they're going to exercise their will to rebel the way Lucifer rebelled. They're going to rebel. But they're not angels. They're made in our image. They're not angels. They're made in our image. And I love them. And I love them. What are we going to do? And the second person of the Trinity spoke up and said, I will go. I will go and I will redeem them. And I will restore them. And they laid out this beautiful plan whereby Jesus Christ came to earth. And that's why he said, we do not yet see all things put under him. But the very next thing he says is, but we see Jesus, who was a little lower than the angels, crowned with glory and honor for the suffering of death. When we think of Jesus, I don't know what part of Jesus' life you think of. Many people, they think of Jesus in the manger, that little tiny baby, that precious little baby in the manger, and they just get oh goo goo and gaga over the baby in the manger. And it's good, it's good, that's good. But do you understand why he's in a manger? Well, because there was no room for them in the end. You think that caught God by surprise? You think Almighty God that put this entire solar system working, the Almighty God that could stop the sun and make it stand still for a while, you think that Almighty God wasn't big enough to make sure there was a hotel room for Joseph and Mary when they got to Bethlehem? Really? Or was something else going on? Something else was going on. That manger, in that stable, 
See, we, we got it all westernized. You know, our manger scenes look like a western barn. And that. No, no, it was a cave. It was a cave in a field. And they'll, 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 they'll have, you know, they'll have sheep and cows and goats. All there. No, no, no. There, 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 there were no cows in that barn. That barn was in a particular field. They had to go to that barn, use that manger, because it was in a very specific field. It was in the fields of Migdal Eder. Interesting enough, the fields that bordered Rebecca's tomb. That's really curious. But in those fields, why those fields? Because those fields raised sheep only. And not just your normal everyday sheep to get the wool. They raised sheep for Passover, to be sacrificed at Passover. Sheep that would be examined. Sheep that would be taken out of the field and set aside in the month of Nisan, the month of Abib, specifically to be examined, and then would be sacrificed on Passover. And Jesus, the Son of God, had to be born in that barn, in that manger, in that field, because Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world, who would be crucified on Passover. To redeem us. To redeem us. To redeem us. Now, I don't know what you think about the word repent. It, it gets really, really bad press today. Repent. But let me help you understand. Repentance is critical because if there is no repentance, there can be no redemption. The reason that's important is because when you will repent, when you will say to God, God, you're right. I am a sinner. I am stubborn. I am self-willed. I have wanted to do my own thing and live my own way. I have not obeyed you. I have disobeyed you. And I have done wrong. And God, I am repenting of that. I renounce it. I turn from it. I turn to you, Jesus. I am coming to you, Jesus. Yes. Repentance leads to redemption. Yes. Redemption washes your heart clean and gives you a new heart. And gives you the ability to have of the power of a renewed mind. And through repentance and redemption, then you are now, what? Reconciled to God. You're restored in the relationship with Almighty God so that now as a restored child of Almighty God, you can be restored to God's original design. What God originally meant for you. Hallelujah. That's why the very next verse says, but we see Jesus made a little lower than the angels crowned with glory and honor for the suffering of death, that he might bring many sons to glory. Yes. See, he's restoring us to the glory that God originally meant for us to have. Yes. Now, let me just give you a little, little nugget here, okay? When you first get saved, he leaves you in this body. But that's not the final word. Because there's a day coming very soon when we're going to get our glorified body. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. And it won't get sick. It won't be diseased. And we're going to radiate the glory of Almighty God for all eternity. We're going to live in that glorified body that God originally meant for mankind to live in. Yes. But between now and then, in this body, when you are redeemed and restore, reconciled and restored, you have the kingdom of God living in you. And you get, to, you get to live the way God originally designed. Let me show you what I mean. It's found in John 14, verses 12 to 14. This is Jesus speaking in your Bible. If you've got the red letter edition, these words are in red. 
The old King James says it this way. Truly, truly, I say unto you, he that believes in me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you ask anything in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Look at what Jesus is saying. Every born-again child of God that is born again and believes in Jesus, you are called to do the same works that Jesus did. How come? Because you are now restored to God's original design. Yes. Jesus Christ was the perfect man here on earth that came to do the perfect work of Almighty God and to restore the kingdom of God on earth. That's why when he came preaching, he kept preaching, the kingdom of God is at hand. It's here now, and it's going to be in the lives of everyone who believes in me. So when you are born again, the kingdom of God comes into you. This is your true identity. This is your true identity. The kingdom of God lives in you. Wherever you go, you take the kingdom of God with you. When you go to work tomorrow, you take the kingdom of God with you. Now, you may be living fat, dumb, and happy, and not realizing that you're the kingdom of Almighty God. But it's time you woke up and realized that. That's why the church in America is so asleep. That's why we don't know how to fight. We think we've got to fight it as a Democrat, fight it as a Republican, fight it as an Independent, fight it as something else. No, no, no. We don't fight on those terms. We fight on the terms that we are now the kingdom of God on earth. And we have a higher authority. We have a higher authority. We have a higher authority. Higher authority than our president. And someone says, he's preaching rebellion. What's he doing? What, where, where are we going? No, 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 no. Remember what I said earlier? We don't fight this warfare that way. We fight it on our knees. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We have the kingdom of God within us. Wherever we go, we have the kingdom of God within us. The kingdom of God is where the throne of God is. Wherever the throne of God is, that's where his authority is. And wherever his authority is exercised, that's where his power is released. So you have the kingdom of God within you. With the kingdom of God within you, then Jesus also said, I give to you the keys of the kingdom, that whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. And so wherever we go, wherever we go, Wherever we go, we have the kingdom of God within us, and we have the authority to exercise that kingdom authority and power. Yes. Yes. When Jesus was teaching on prayer, he said, after this manner, therefore, pray ye. He didn't say, after this manner, therefore, all the super spiritual ones and all the pastors pray like this. He was talking to the church, every one of you, after this manner, therefore, pray ye. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You have the authority to pray the kingdom of God into a situation and the will of God to be done in a situation. How come we're not doing that? Because we're asleep in the light. Because the church doesn't really know who she is. And because she doesn't re know really who she is, she just gets beat up and then hopes the next political party will get in there and change things. Dumb. Stop it. Know who you are. Realize your true identity. And rise up and live like a child of God. Stop letting Satan beat you up and beat your family up. How long are you going to let alcohol continue to destroy your home and your life? How long are you going to let meth continue to destroy your life and your home? How long are you going to continue to let all of this stuff just ruin you? Your fear, your worry, your anxiety, your depression, your despair. How long are you going to live in that? 
Let me tell you, not one more day. Not one more day. Not one more day. You're a child of God. You're redeemed. The kingdom of God is within you. You have the authority that Jesus said, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Come on. Rise up. Be who you are in Christ. Boy, guys, one day says, Dean, don't you ever get down? I mean, you're always smiling. Don't you ever get down? I looked at him and said, Don't ask Wanda. <laughs> I, I'd be absolutely fabricating if I told you, Oh, no, I'm never down. That's not true. But I don't stay down. I refuse to stay down. I refuse to stay down. Because you have the, the kingdom authority. The kingdom of God is in here. And I have the authority. I have the keys of the kingdom. So that means, as a steward of his kingdom, I can be fruitful. I can multiply. I can replenish the earth. And I can subdue the kingdom of darkness. And I can take dominion. And where Satan one time had control, I can now take control. 